Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Into the Killing. In this week's episode, we're going to take a look at the murder of a nine-year-old girl that happened in the mid-1980s. When the case was finally solved decades later, the identity of the killer was shocking to everyone because he was an incredibly infamous criminal. The specific whole case we're discussing today happened on April 10th, 1984. The top song in the United States was Footloose by Kenny Loggins. The number one movie at the box office was the comedy Police Academy. The Major League Baseball season started eight days earlier and the Detroit Tigers were enjoying a win streak that would last nine games. The Tigers would eventually go on to win the World Series. The Tenderloin is a neighborhood in downtown San Francisco, California. In the 1950s and early 60s, it was the hub for notable jazz musicians at the legendary Black Hawk nightclub. With its speakeasies, brothels, and gambling dens, it was also a place to go indulge in vices. The Tenderloin has a history of being a rougher neighborhood with a high crime rate. Nine-year-old Mei Lung lived in an apartment in the Tenderloin neighborhood with her mother, two sisters, and brother. Mei was the eldest. Four years earlier, the family had moved there from Hong Kong. The year before, Mei's father left the family. Mei's mother supported her four children by working in a restaurant. Mei also went by the name Linda. Her Chinese name, Mei, means beautiful. Mei was in the fourth grade and she was a bright girl who loved reading. On April 10th, 1984, May and her eight-year-old brother returned home from school. In the apartment building, May's brother took the elevator and May was planning on taking the stairs. Her brother made it to the apartment, but nine-year-old May did not. A short time later, May's dead body was found in the basement of the apartment building. Her body was found hanging above the ground by her shirt on a pipe. May had been sexually assaulted. She had been stabbed multiple times in the back and then her blouse was tied around her neck and tied to the pipe. A reward of $10,000 was offered for information leading to an arrest in the case. But it wasn't long before the murder of May Long went cold. This would prove to be incredibly unfortunate because this was just the start of the killer's horrible crime spree. Had he been captured after May's murder, many lives would have been saved. Two months after May was killed, on June 28, 1984, the police were called to the home of 79-year-old Jenny Vincow. Vincow lived alone in Los Angeles, California, which is about 380 miles from San Francisco. Her home was a bloody crime scene. Blood was splattered all over the bedroom and the bathroom. She had been stabbed multiple times and her throat was slit nearly to the point of decapitation. Finn Cow had been raped possibly after she was dead. The police determined that the killer got into her home through an open window. The police found five partial fingerprints on a window. Unfortunately, the prints did not match anyone in their system. For many reasons, no one connected the murders of Mei Lung and Jenny Vincow. First, the crime scenes were committed hundreds of miles apart. Secondly, Vincow was killed in a home invasion and Mei was possibly lured or forced into her apartment building's basement. There was also a huge discrepancy in the ages of the victims. Vin Cao was 79 and May was just 9 years old. The police also wouldn't connect the subsequent murders the killer committed to the killing of Jenny Vin Cao for a long time. The next murder went down on March 17, 1985 
about eight months after Vincat was killed. 22-year-old Maria Herendez returned to her home in Rosemead, which is a city in Los Angeles County. It was late when she returned home and Hernandez drove into her garage. A man dressed in black and armed with a gun followed her into the garage. He shot at her and Hernandez instinctually put up her hands to shield herself. Amazingly, she had her keys in her hand and they deflected the bullet. This saved her from a serious, possibly fatal, injury. Hernandez fell to the garage floor and played dead. The man then entered the condominium. While he was gone, Hernandez tried to gather her bearings. As the gunman was leaving, Hernandez encountered him again. She begged him not to shoot her. For whatever reason, he didn't. Instead, he got into his car and he drove off into the night. Angela went inside. On the kitchen floor, she found the dead body of her 34-year-old roommate, Dale Okazaki. She had been shot once in the forehead. About an hour later, the police were called to a quiet neighborhood in Monterey Park, just a few miles from the crime scene. 30-year-old law student Sai Lian Yu was found lying next to her running car. It was clear she had been pulled from her car and shot multiple times. Tragically, she died before an ambulance arrived. The police knew that these two murders were connected simply because they took place so close to each other within an hour. Also, both murders seem motiveless. We're going to take a short break to bring you a word from our sponsor, Best Fiends. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. When it comes to music, I really like punk, new wave, old country, but one song I listen to all the time is a guilty pleasure of mine. That song is Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus. I don't know, there's just something about that song. Once it starts, I put my hands in the air, and yeah, it's embarrassing. What I'm not embarrassed about is my love for the game Best Fiends. Best Fiends is an amazing match three game. I'm not the only one who loves Best Fiends. It's been downloaded over a million times and has a five star rating. It's a perfect game for casual gamers like myself. I love playing it whenever I get a few minutes or while I'm listening to a podcast. You collect a cast of fiends and then you use them to solve each level and defeat the slugs. I'm on level 93 right now and I plan on making it to triple digits this weekend. New levels, events, and challenges are added every month, so there's always something new to do in the game. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends with F-E-R, Best Fiends. Ten days after the murders, a man named Pierre Cesara summoned the police to his parents' home in Whittier, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. His 64-year-old father, Vincent, had been an investment counselor. But he had retired to follow his dream, owning and operating his own restaurant. He had a small but popular pizzeria. Vincent's 44-year-old wife, Maxine, was a successful lawyer. Their home was a brutal crime scene, which haunted even veteran investigators. Vincent had been shot once in the head. The killer clearly spent more time on Maxine. Maxine had been shot in the head, stabbed multiple times, and her eyes had been gouged out. Also, a T had been carved into her chest in her heart area. It appeared the killer climbed in through a bedroom window. Throughout April, there were no murders. Then, on May 14th, the 911 dispatch center in Los Angeles County received a call. A man on the line said, help, and the system registered that the call came from a home in Monterey Park. First responders raced to the home. It belonged to 65-year-old William Doy and his 64-year-old wife, Lily. Lily had suffered a stroke years earlier and she used a wheelchair. 
The police found William dying and Lily had been assaulted. A man had broken into their home by cutting a screen door. William knew someone was in his home and he tried to grab one of his guns but he was shot in the face before he could. The shot did not kill him. So the home invader punched him into unconsciousness. The intruder put thumb cuffs on Lily and then ransacked the house. He came back into the bedroom and he found that William had regained consciousness. So he knocked him out again. The home invader then proceeded to rape Lily. When the man was finished, he left the couple's home with some stolen items. William managed to make the 911 call that brought first responders to his home. It's believed that this call saved the life of his wife. But it was too late for William. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. We're just going to take a quick break to bring you word from another one of our great sponsors, Audible. I absolutely and unequivocally love Audible. Reading books has always been one of my favorite pastimes, but sometimes life gets to be so hectic that I don't have time to sit and read. That's why I love Audible. I listen to some amazing fiction and nonfiction audiobooks while I'm doing chores like washing the dishes or grocery shopping. It's gotten to the point where I actually like doing chores because I get to listen to my audiobooks. Audible has so much more than audiobooks. They have original entertainment and original podcasts. This includes some amazing true crime podcasts. A really insightful podcast is called The Dark Web. I had heard of The Dark Web and the nefarious things that supposedly happened on it, but I didn't know much about it. It was really eye-opening to listen to the podcast. Not too long ago, Audible launched Audible Plus. With Audible Plus, you get access to thousands of titles, including audiobooks, podcasts, and series that you can listen without limits. You can listen offline, anytime, and anywhere. Personally, I listen on my Alexa device. Audible has so many excellent titles to recommend. But if you've never checked out Truman Capote's masterpiece, A Cold Blood, you should check that one out. It's considered the first true crime book ever written, and in my opinion, it's one of the best. It's narrated by Scott Brick, who is one of the best narrators working today. I could listen to him read a phone book. Sign up for Audible today and you can listen to In Cold Blood and the Dark Web yourself. Visit audible.com slash listed or text listed to 500-500 to start your free 30-day trial. Once again, for your free 30-day trial, check out audible.com slash listed. That's spelled A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash L-I-S-T-E-D or text listed, that's L-I-S-T-E-D, to 500-500. Find something great to listen to and help support Criminally Listed by checking out Audible. Monrovia, California is a small town about 20 miles northeast of Los Angeles. It was home to a pair of elderly sisters, 83-year-old Mabel Bell and 81-year-old Florence Lang. Lang was disabled and Bell took care of her. Bell was fiercely independent and played bridge three times a week. Their home was picturesque with a white picket fence out front and an orange tree in the yard. Bell liked that her home was a bit isolated from the other homes in the area. She felt safe and rarely locked her doors. As it approached midnight on May 29, 1985, the sisters were asleep in their bedrooms. A man entered their home and picked up a hammer. First, he beat Florence Lang in the head and then tied her hands behind her back. He then went into the bedroom of Mabel Bell. Bell was still sleeping. The intruder struck her in the head with a hammer and this caused her to wake up screaming. He delivered another blow and this knocked her unconscious. He bound her ankles with duct tape. He then pulled the electrical cord out of her clock. Using the wire, he shocked her. The man then went back into Lang's room and raped her. Before he left, the man used lipstick to draw a pentagram on the back of Mabel Bell's left thigh and on the wall above her bed. 
He also drew a pentagram on Lang's wall. He then left at the front door, carrying several stolen items in a pillowcase and got into his stolen car. He drove away, leaving the sisters to die. The next day, he drove to the Los Angeles suburb of Burbank. At random, he chose the house of 42-year-old Carol Kyle. Kyle lived with her daughter and 11-year-old son, Mark. That night, her daughter was at her friend's home. The man managed to unlock the back door by reaching through the doggy door. Once inside, he raped Carol twice while Mark was locked in the closet. Afterward, he handcuffed the mother and son to a headboard and then left, driving off in the stolen car. Mark managed to reach the phone and he called 911. A day or two later, a gardener arrived at the home of Mabel Bell and Florence Lang. Somehow, they were still alive. They were rushed to the hospital. Six weeks later, on July 15th, Mabel Bell died as a result of her injuries. Her younger sister, Florence Lang, survived the brutal assault. 31-year-old Patty Lane Higgins lived alone in Arcadia, a city about 17 miles northeast of downtown Los Angeles. Higgins was a school teacher. In June 1985, the building next to her home was under construction. The foreman needed a phone, so he asked Higgins if he could hook their phone up to her line and they would pay her. Higgins agreed. On the morning of June 28th, the foreman noticed that the phone kept ringing. So he answered the phone. It was someone from Higgins' school. They were concerned because she hadn't shown up that day. The foreman went to Higgins' back door and saw that someone had broken in. He let himself in and he saw that the house had been ransacked. He found Higgins' body. She had nearly been decapitated. She had also been beaten and raped. Days later, on July 2nd, 75-year-old Mary Louise Cannon was murdered in her home in Arcadia. She had been severely beaten and her throat had been slashed with a knife from her kitchen. Her house had been ransacked and some items had been stolen. Her body was found by some neighbors who helped her with her chores. Three nights later, the same man broke into the home of the Bennett family in Sierra Madre. At the time, the family was sleeping. Using a tire iron, he struck 16-year-old Whitney Bennett nearly a dozen times in the head. He then strangled her with a telephone cord. He did not attack Whitney's parents, who slept while their daughter was being attacked. He gathered up a few valuables, and they left. Whitney woke up a few hours later with no recollection of the attack. She ultimately survived the brutal assault. For 21 years, 60-year-old Joyce Nelson lived alone in Monterey Park. On the night of July 7th, Two days after Whitney was attacked, Nelson was sitting on her couch watching TV. She eventually drifted off to sleep. The killer broke into her home, and even though he was armed with a 22 caliber pistol, he beat Nelson to death with his hands and feet. Hours later, the same man broke into the home of 63-year-old Sophie Dickman, who also lived in Monterey Park. He handcuffed her and punched her several times. He tried to rape her, but he was unable to get an erection. He ended up leaving her alive, handcuffed to her bed. Dickman was able to drag the bed to a window, and she called out for help. Less than two weeks later, the killer seemed to be feeling exceptionally savage. His barbaric criminal activity began just after midnight, on July 20th. For 28 years, 68-year-old Max and Needing and his 66-year-old wife, Leela, lived on a quiet street in Glendale, 
a suburb of Los Angeles. Max had known three Shell service stations, and Leela worked in the security department of a department store. The couple had a son and daughter and several grandchildren. They were asleep when the predator entered their home through a set of unlocked French doors. As they laid in bed, he attacked them with a machete. To make sure they were dead, he shot them. When he was finished, he left the home with some valuables and then got into a stolen car. Hours later, he was in Sun Valley, a Los Angeles neighborhood. At random, he picked the home of the Covenant family. 32-year-old Chanarong was sleeping in bed with his wife, some kid. Their 8-year-old son and 2-year-old daughter were asleep in their bedrooms. The killer found a sliding glass door unlocked. He entered the house and he made his way to the master bedroom. He shot Chanarong in the head. The gunshot woke up some kid and she saw that her husband had been shot. So she started crying. The killer laughed at her. He then proceeded to punch and kick her. When she was beaten down, he handcuffed and raped her several times. When he was done with her, he tied her up in her bedroom. He then went into the bedroom of her eight-year-old son. While some kid helplessly listened, he raped the young boy. The intruder stole some items and left the family's home. Some kid was able to free herself and she was able to get help. The bodies of Maxon and Leela Needing were found by their daughter hours later when they didn't show up for breakfast at a local restaurant. The killer took another two-week break. On August 6, 1985, he broke into a home in the Northridge neighborhood of Los Angeles. It was the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson, who were a middle-class couple. Chris was a truck driver, and Virginia was a postal employee. The killer shot both Chris and Virginia in the head as they laid in bed. But neither of them were killed or even lost consciousness. They tried to communicate with each other to figure out what had happened to them. As they did, the shooter laughed at them. Even though Chris had a bullet lodged in his brain, he got out of bed and advanced on the shooter. The gunman ran from Chris and fled the house. Both Virginia and Chris survived the shooting. Diamond Bar is a city in Los Angeles County. Around 3 a.m. on August 8th, one of the residents was woken up because someone was ringing his doorbell. He opened the door and he was surprised by what he found. It was the three-year-old son of his next-door neighbors, Sakina and Elias Abawath. 35-year-old Elias was a computer programmer and Sakina was a medical technician. The neighbor walked the child back to the family's home and he found the front door open. He went inside and he found Sakina handcuffed to her bedroom door. She was bloody and beaten. The neighbor called the police. It turned out that the intruder had entered the family's home through an unlocked sliding glass door. He first saw Elias and they proceeded to beat and rape Sakina. At this point, the people of Los Angeles County were terrified. The killer often broke into homes through unlocked doors and windows. The residents were being more vigilant and the police stepped up patrols. So the killer took a road trip. 66-year-old Peter Pan and his wife, Barbara, lived in an affluent neighborhood in San Francisco. The killer entered their home by taking a screen off a window and shot Peter in the head. He then proceeded to sexually assault Barbara. She fought back against him and he shot her in the head. On a wall and lipstick, the killer wrote Jack the Knife and drew a pentagram. He helped himself to some of the pan's valuables and they left. 
The next morning, the pan son found the couple. Peter was dead, and Barbara was barely clinging to life. She was rushed to the hospital, and she survived. The police in Los Angeles County knew that the home invasion was committed by the same man who was responsible for the mayhem in their county. The first is that the double homicide matched the killer's M.O. He broke into a home through an unlocked window or door. He killed the husband first and then sexually assaulted the shocked wife. The killer also seemed to have an obsession with Satanism. In several home invasions, he talked to victims about Satan. He told several surviving victims to swear on Satan or say that they love Satan. He had also drawn pentagrams at previous crime scenes. But unfortunately, the police still had no clue who the killer was. During that bloody summer of 1985, 29-year-old Bill Carnes was engaged to 27-year-old Ines Erickson. Carnes was a computer expert. He lived in Mission Viejo, which is in Orange County. It's about 50 miles southeast of downtown Los Angeles. On the night of August 24th, Carnes and Erickson went out to a movie. While they were out, they talked about the brutal serial murders that had rocked California. The media had started calling the killer the Night Stalker. When he murdered one of his earliest known victims, Dale Okazaki, he left behind a hat. On the hat was the logo for the hard rock band ACDC. The last song on their classic album, Highway to Hell, is Night Prowler. This somehow got changed to Night Stalker, which is the name that was bestowed on the killer. The band later clarified that the song had no evil intentions. They said it was about being a young man and trying to sneak into a girlfriend's bedroom while her parents were asleep. After the movie, Carnes and Erickson went to bed in Carnes' home. At about 2.30 a.m., the Night Stalker broke into their home. He shot Carnes three times in the head. He tied up Erickson and raped her. During the home invasion, the man referred to himself as the Night Stalker. He ended up leaving Erickson alive. As he walked out of the house, she watched him from a window and saw him get into an orange Toyota. She then called 911. Carnes was rushed to the hospital. He survived, but suffered severe brain damage. Inez Erickson was not the only person who saw the Night Stalker in the car. A teenage boy living in the neighborhood noticed someone driving an orange Toyota. Something about the way the person was driving seemed off, so he wrote down the license plate. It turned out that the Toyota had been stolen. It was found abandoned four days after the attempted murder in the parking lot of a shopping center in downtown Los Angeles. The car had been wiped down, but a single fingerprint was found. The police ran it through their system, and they got a match. It was the fingerprint of a 25-year-old man named Ricardo Ramirez, who went by the name Richard. Richard Ramirez was born on February 29, 1960, in El Paso, Texas. He was the youngest of five children. When his mother was pregnant with him, she was working at a factory that made boots. The strong chemicals made her sick. She needed special injections to keep the fetus alive. Ramirez's father was prone to fits of anger and he would become abusive. When Ramirez was two, a dresser fell on him and he was nearly killed. He lost consciousness for about 15 minutes and had to get 30 stitches. When he was five, he was knocked unconscious again when he was hit by a swing. In the fifth grade, he started suffering seizures. He was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. When Ramirez was nine, he started to withdraw from people and he became a loner. 
He started smoking marijuana when he was just 10 years old. Around the same time, he was having problems dealing with his father's temper, so he started sleeping in a cemetery. When Ramirez was 12, he started hanging out with his cousin, Miguel Ramirez, who went by the name Mike. Mike was a Green Beret who served in Vietnam. He often talked to Ramirez about his exploits in Vietnam. They were often gory stories and in several cases involved him raping and murdering women. He even had photographs of him committing these acts. One photograph showed him forcing a woman to perform oral sex on him. Then another photo showed Mike posing with the same woman's severed head. Ramirez supposedly became turned on by these photos. On May 4, 1973, Mike and his wife, Jessie, got into an argument while 12-year-old Ramirez was there. Mike grabbed a 38 caliber handgun and he shot his wife in the face, killing her. Ramirez witnessed the shooting. Mike was arrested and charged with murder. He was later found not guilty by reason of insanity and he was committed to a psychiatric hospital. After witnessing the murder, Ramirez lost interest in school. He went to visit his brother in Los Angeles. His brother taught him how to pick logs and break into homes. Ramirez even went along with his brother on a few burglaries. Ramirez also became interested in pornography at this time. When Ramirez was 13, he moved in with his sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto. Roberto was a peeping Tom, and he took Ramirez with him on his escapades. As a teenager, Ramirez would kill and dismember animals. Between the ages of 18 and 24, Ramirez was arrested several times, but he never did any long stints in prison. Then, it was believed that he committed his first murder on June 28, 1984, when he killed 79-year-old Jenny Vincow. When the police determined that Richard Ramirez was the Night Stalker, he happened to be in Tucson, Arizona. He had planned on visiting his brother, but his brother wasn't around. So Ramirez got on a bus back to Los Angeles. He had no idea that he was the most wanted man in California. Early on the morning of August 31st, 1985, he got off the bus in Los Angeles. There was a heavy police presence at the bus station, but they were watching buses that were leaving Los Angeles. They had assumed that Ramirez was still in the city and he might be trying to flee. Ramirez slipped by the police and he went to a convenience store. A group of elderly women recognized him and they called him El Matador, which means the killer. Ramirez then got a look at a newspaper and saw his face on the front page. He ran from the store. He tried to steal a car from a woman, but people nearby saw this happening and they hurried towards them. Ramirez ran into an alley. He ended up in a woman's backyard and the woman recognized him as the killer plastered all over the media. She called the police and soon police sirens filled the air. Ramirez was eventually subdued by a group of citizens who beat him while waiting for the police to arrive. He was arrested and finally the reign of terror was over. Richard Ramirez was eventually charged with 13 counts of murder and 5 counts of attempted murder. In October 1985, Ramirez pleaded not guilty to all charges. As he was being led out of the court, he held up his hand, which he had drawn a pentagram on, and yelled, Hail Satan! Ramirez's trial started at the end of January 1989, about three and a half years after he was arrested. The trial lasted for months. On August 14th, one of the jurors didn't show up for court. She was 31-year-old Phil Singletary. Like Ramirez, Singletary had been born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Later that day, Singletary was found murdered in her apartment. 
she had been beaten and shot to death. The jurors were concerned that Ramirez was somehow responsible for the murder. But it turned out that Singletary had been killed by her boyfriend. He was later found dead. He had shot himself with the same gun they used to kill Singletary. The trial concluded in September 1989 and the jury deliberated for 22 days. Richard Ramirez was found guilty on all charges. However, he was found guilty of second degree murder instead of first degree murder when it came to the killing of Salen Yu. In November 1989, Ramirez was sentenced to death. He told reporters, big deal, death always went with the territory, see you in Disneyland. Although Ramirez had been convicted of 13 murders for years, it was suspected that he was responsible for 14 murders. The charges against him for the murder of Patty Elaine Higgins were dismissed due to a lack of evidence. Then, in October 2009, it was announced that Richard Ramirez's DNA had been linked to the murder of nine-year-old Mei Long. It had been 25 years since Mei had been murdered. This makes Mei Long Ramirez's first known victim and brought his total body count to 15. However, he was never charged with her murder. Ramirez was never executed for his crimes. He died in prison on June 7, 2013 at the age of 53. The cause of death was complications from B-cell lymphoma. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, our producer and sound designer is Nell Cloutier. You can find her on Instagram. The link is in the description box below. If you just discovered this podcast, you should check us out on YouTube. We have over 275 videos featuring some bizarre and disturbing true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like or subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. But that's all for today. Thanks again for listening. Take care of yourself and please stay safe.